Bobcats. Today we are reading The Undrowned by K.R. Alexander. This is a scary book, so what better choice to read on Halloween um, than a good spooky story. So we're going to actually read, um, there's a chapter zero, <laughs> kind of weird, and a chapter one. So we're going to read both of those. So the dedication says, for those unafraid to face their demons. Chapter zero. The dead don't come back. When I was a little girl, maybe four or five, I remember my mom patiently explaining this to me as we buried my pet hamster in the backyard. I was crying because I was confused. Why was Nom Nom sleeping for so long? Why wasn't he waking up? Why had my mom insisted we make him a cute bed of paper towels and spare fabric and flowers and bury him in a shoebox by the daffodils? How could he see? How could he breathe? You see, Samantha, Mom said, sometimes when animals get very sick or old, they go to sleep and they never wake up again. Never? I asked, sniffling. Never. She took my hand and together we said goodbye to Nom Nom and began to shovel dirt on top of him. I still didn't know why we were saying goodbye. I still didn't understand how something could sleep forever. Even when I was really tired, I woke up eventually. But what if he's different, I ask. What if he's really just sleeping? He's not coming back, Pumpkin. He's dead now, and the dead don't come back. I swallowed, and things clicked far too quickly in my too young brain. Do people die too, I ask. She paused. I remember the way she looked at me, like she was trying to figure out whether or not to tell me the truth. I could feel myself teetering on the edge of something vast and terrifying in that moment. And her answer would either pull me back to safety or push me over the edge. Yes, she finally said, people die too. And just like Nom Nom, they don't come back. I thought for years that she would decided to tell me the truth. Only now am I realizing that it was a lie. Because when I pushed Rachel into the lake and she didn't come back up, I knew she was dead. She wasn't coming back. Except the next day, she did. Chapter 1. Wednesday is not going my way, and I know just who's going to pay for it. I still have my parents' argument ringing in my ears when I get to school. All morning, they've been fighting, not just about each other and how they both work too much, which is what they usually spend breakfast fighting about, but because I failed a spelling test, one stupid spelling test. Now they're refusing to take me on a day trip to Rocky River Adventure Park this Saturday, like they'd promised, all because I misspelled a few words, like possessed and allegory. Who needs to know how to spell those anyway? I always have my phone, and that can just fix spelling for me, as if I'd ever pay, as if I'd ever use any of the spelling words in the first place. So no theme park for me. My so-called friends will still be going because their parents aren't jerks like mine, and I'm sure I'll hear about how amazing it was on Monday. All I get to look forward to this weekend is doing homework while my parents continue to argue downstairs and my sister plays video games with her friends. And none of it's fair because it's not really my fault that I didn't have time to study for the spelling test. I'd been too busy writing the essay that Rachel was supposed to do for me. She let me down again. It's her fault. All of this is her fault. And I'm going to make sure it's the last time. I stomp through the school's front door and down the hallway. It must be pretty clear that I'm angry. Kids actually step away from me, parting and going quiet so I can pass, hoping they won't be the latest victims of my wrath. I shove past a few of them, knock books out of a nerd's hand, slam another kid into his friend, no different from my normal entrance. But the truth is, I barely even see them. They're not worth my time, let alone my anger. Rachel is. I see her at her locker before she ever sees me, short and pretty, with long black hair and perfect skin and big blue eyes. I'm tall and I have the same black hair, but my skin is far from perfect, which some kids used to make fun of me for until I started pushing back and proving that I wasn't someone that you could make fun of. Now, the only bully in this school is me. You, I growl when I reach her locker. I slam it shut to emphasize my point. She jumps back with a yelp and clutches her sketchbook to her chest with both hands, eyes wide and lip already quivering like a baby's. She knows when I'm in a bad mood. 
And it's clear she knows this is worse than all the rest. I, shut up, I say. Do you have any idea what you've done? I, I, she stutters. Because of you and your stupid little pea brain, my parents aren't taking me to the adventure park this weekend. You were supposed to write my essay, but you didn't. And because of that, I couldn't study for the spelling test. It's your fault that I failed and you're going to pay for it. I wanted to shove her against her locker, but I hold myself back. Partly because I know that she just started crying and partly because I see our principal, Mr. Detmer, out of the corner of my eye. He's watching us. I don't need to get, it, to get a detention again. The last thing I need is to be grounded. I lower my voice. I'm going to get you back for this. I look into her eyes and she looks to her feet. If I have to suffer, so will you. Now hand it over. She nods. She doesn't ask what I want or what I mean. She already knows. We have this down to an art. Um, in our relationship, we have a situation where both parties benefit from the other's skills. I learned that, that term in science, symbiotic. It's a symbiotic relationship. In this case, it means I don't have to beat her up, and she does my homework, and she pays for my lunch. It wasn't always like this with us. We used to be best friends, used to. I can't even really imagine it anymore. I guess we were friends when we were both younger, weaker. Now, I'm no longer weak. She taught me that friendship is the ultimate weakness. Friends can hurt you. Friends can make your whole life miserable if they know everything about you. And from her betrayal, I grew strong. I used that lesson against her because she deserved all that and more. Am I using her? Sure. But... It's the only use that she has in our school. Otherwise, she's nothing. I make sure of it. She opens her locker again, which takes a second since she has to re-enter her code and pulls out a folder. I flip it open and check. She hasn't disappointed me on this, at least. She knows not to let me down again. The, so the social studies homework we got yesterday is done, along with the math practice sheets. <laughs> And there, in the front pocket, is the $5 she gives me every day for lunch. I never ask where she gets the money. Probably her parents. They're loaded. They even have a pool in their backyard. Perfect Rachel and her perfect life. Her perfectly useless life. She could give me a million dollars and she'd still owe me. I snap the folder shut and slam her locker closed again. I miss her fingers, but barely. Gotta keep her a little scared. Tears well in her eyes. I don't say anything when I turn and stomp down the hall to my locker. I shove into another kid on the way, making her drop her bag, her books, her homework, scattering all over the floor. Mr. Det Detmer calls out to me, but I'm already around the corner, and I know he won't follow. He's a little scared of me, too. He should be. They all should be. Chapter 2. All right, so if you're interested in The Undrowned, um, check it out. Uh, K.R. Alexander also has several other books in our library, so you can check out those spooky stories too. You won't regret it.